about myself this evening. I'm going to talk in the beginning half, as you've probably seen in the program. The second half, we was hoping to be able to start with some sort of a little bit different, have a bit of music, but sadly, our musician and composer Cynthia has fallen ill, so she won't be able to join us. So I can instead, play for um, you. just have another couple of old blokes talking. <laughs> <laughs> he can, he can yeah. play. He can I can play. play. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think it's all right, because we haven't planned <laughs> no, anything in advance, that's fine. So, um, it's going to be myself first talking about my work, and then we've got two very interesting gentlemen, actually, uh, who will come along and talk about their work. And I, I chose them because of the fact they were, in a sense, both um, kinetic or, in some sense, scientific artists like myself. So I wanted you to have a kind of a background feel that I'm not the only person uh, doing this kind of thing, there are others as well. So, here I am. And also... The name of the show, the theme, I had this idea, I call it the Spaceship of the Imagination, because I realised this really where really it all began. So, um, here I am. Oh, I'm not quite sure when this photo was taken, maybe seven years old, something like that. Uh, just seven years ago. <laughs> just, yeah, just such a short time ago. And this is the age when you know, the, the space age began, and as I mentioned in the Rise Up in the Catalogue, um, that's, you know, that's really what fired off my imagination more than anything. And I, I, I was already obviously heading towards becoming a, a sculptor long before I had any idea, and I was just playing my games, and then uh, space travel and astronomy fascinated me. And I, here's a cover of my very first astronomy book, which I treasure so much, I saved it, and I kept this. The book it's still sitting on a uh, dusty on some upper shelf at home and um, here's an illustration from another one of those books I had from the early days it's a different book here this is all about space travel rather than astronomy and I think these paintings that were done at the time are so inspirational this is was at the time a very famous um, graphic painter Chesley Bonnestell who who actually discussed these, these Paint, uh, the designs with the, the, the great men of the day. So they were intended to be realistically showing what they imagined would be possible and what would be going on by the year 2000 that we'll be building these amazing space stations and maybe uh, building spaceships on a grand scale ready to go off and explore the solar system. So this was you know, as worked out with Ferner von Braun. This is what they realistically hoped to somehow inspire the Americans to spend money on building things like this. Which go to the moon and then, not just go to the moon, but go all over the solar system so they could land on the, the, the satellites of Saturn, say, that's supposed to be Saturn, seen heads on, so you can't quite see the rings, but that line across represents the rings. A, you know, to me, this is all sound so real, I just was completely hooked and became a space addict from this very, very young age. Now, there's no reason to become an artist if you're interested in going into space or being an astronomer. But, as it happened, my mother was an artist, and as it happened, there was some damn good art that was sort of technical, required some engineering. And at the turn of the seventh decade, 1970, this neon structure was built on the, the roof of... Heads. Yeah, well, yes. In 1970, this roof... The roof of the Haywood Gallery and all along the river on that south bank suddenly lit up by this amazing neon structure which was constructed and actually stood on that rooftop there for the best part of 30 years. They didn't dismantle it until many, many donkeys later. But it was built there to celebrate a giant exhibition of kinetic art. And it was the one day I took off from my um, time in, uh, when I was at Sussex University at the time, came up to London uh, and went to this wonderful show, which of which I have not a single photograph, but the most inspiring artist of all there was a gentleman called Nicholas Schofer, a um, Hungarian who lived in Paris. I never actually met him, but I did subsequently meet his wife, uh, she, who would of course by then become widow, sadly, because he died long before, but she lived on some extraordinary age. I think she lived to be nearly 100 years old, and I remember visiting in Paris not so long ago, but she has now passed away as well. And these are photographs from the studio, which she kept lovingly of his kinetic, um, all these things in their day, all the different devices would have been rotating and it was all subject to something less than computer control, it was more in the nature of electromechanical, but he did dream that one day everything would be under computer control, although 
back in 1970. Only if you worked for a vast corporation did you get your hands on a computer. So he used things that look more like what you find inside a, a washing machine in those days. There's large rotary switches which would turn things on and off. And, uh, well, it was good enough for me at the time. I definitely was off in my own world. So this is the first actual works of art I started to create. This is a light show. Um, and here is something more mysterious than a light show. This kind of this first kineticism I got involved with, which was, I call them magic fountains. It is polystyrene granules blown on jets of air. Here's another picture. And you see me faintly in the background there, the, the young me. A bearded and um, operating it. Well, again, it has some kind of electromechanical system for controlling what what it's going to do. Um, and um, yeah, there's another shot, of, you know, a bit wider shot. I think I've accidentally deleted an image out of this. Oh, what a shame! The next image would have shown where I was, but it, it hasn't. So anyway, so anyway um, some more of my early works. This is grazing rays of light, just rays of light, just going across a sheet of really good quality art paper. You know how artists love paper to have texture, it helps yeah. you sort of get the paint to stick to the surface but also give it more substance. But it helps the light stick to the texture as well, I discovered, if you shine beads of light across the surface. And there's some more examples. These are all from my student days. I was at Exeter Art College after I'd finished at Sussex University. And um, Exeter kept me very happy for a little while in their 4D department. Um, also, I, I played around with what, of course, was the absolute charismatic thing of the A's, the liquid light show. So there's a sample of a liquid light show frozen in time forever in the photograph. And another one there. Which doesn't, doesn't definitely have a point. Well, the liquid light shows was a system by which you, you mix together different kinds of in immiscible inks. So some of the inks would be oily, and some of the inks would be water-based, and you would add food colouring or something like that, and then you'd stir it all around, stick in a bit of um, nail varnish removal or whatever else to kind of get it all to bubble away nicely, uh, and generate random, or quasi-random, since there's a lot of artistic and judgment in making, deciding what looks good, uh, and that then that would that could be projected up big, or just could be photographed on the small scale, which is what I was trying to do, rather than projecting it up big, as would have been happening in the early light shows. I wish I had some of the early light shows to show you that I don't. Here's some more early work I was doing. This was um, taking the lens off the front of an SLR camera and shining the light straight into the camera, doing more funny things. More funny things with SLR cameras. And this is the first ever stage design I did. So there's a stage design for a school production and they had a little budget available, so they thought pay me to, not personally to pay me fees, but pay for me to play around and buy some materials and create um, something that was supposed to look like a jungle in the school um, hall, because that was um, allegedly central China, and this was the monkey legend being retold by the children, a story that's so often retold. I think this is the appearance of the monkey god, which has turned into a kinetic work of art with me. Uh, so I think the kids roll on stage this thing with various things rotating, and it's rather misty because it probably had very long exposures and a smoke machine running, so that's, that's as much detail as you get from an old camera. Well, around this time, I did the first wave sculpture, and I, um, I think when they first did these wave sculptures, I didn't realise how much it was going to get me hooked. So this is a little tiny thing, this is probably mm, like, that, like that in my hands, it's like a foot tall, half a metre tall, long since it got lost, destroyed, I don't know what happened to it. But the, the, the system was there was a series of strings and then a little rotor there that would shake and set everything in vibration, so it was like a little tiny light harp, so it was my first attempt at designing a light harp. And I don't have a date for it, I've lost all the documentation of when I made it, but it was after I was a student maybe sometime in the 80s. And at the same time, I also started experimenting with something called chromostrobic light, light that changes colour faster than the eye can see. So in this case, you've got something like a miniature hoop being spun around between two small motors, and as it spins round, the light is changing colour synchronous with the rotation of the hoop, and then you get these sort of interesting bands of colour floating in mid-air. Here's another one of these early experiments. I've just got a large gear wheel plonked a little motor in it 
and have something spinning around attached to the shaft of the motor and skip and project onto the skipping rope. But rather than actually trying to skip, because I'm not very sporty, I think I'll make a miniature skipping rope. It'll just be a piece of string about <coughs> this long, two little tiny motors like I've been using anyway. I switched it on, <coughs> and that happened! And that was one of the most magic moments in my artistic life when I discovered the vibrations on a string. So when you try and skip at high speed, um, you can, if you're really careful, get that skip shape, but you get an awful lot of other things going on, as you know well from this display here. Uh, and um, there's a kind of, that's a classic photo from the early 80s when I first started to explore the uh, vibrations of a wave on a rotating string. Now, as well as being an artist, after I'd left art college, I was really kind of stuck with what on earth can I do as a career, because I was obviously not kind of set out the head into the main art world. So what I did instead was I started doing a bit of stage lighting. And this is actually how I met Ron, the proprietor of this wonderful establishment. And Ron, maybe you can help me here. Have you any idea who is that musician, the pianist? I believe was a very famous, incredibly gifted pianist. Yes. And I, I know this is at the Almeida Theatre and sometime in the early or mid 80s, yes. I would guess. He had a Russian sort of name. I can't remember exactly. Right. Uh, but yes, he was a very accomplished pianist. Um, yes, he, he was definitely a world-class... Uh, that's the Almeida, to... yes, I remember the Almeida Festival. Yes, yeah, so it would be lovely if we could kind of fill in those details one day, and I can have it added to my notes in the presentation, yes. so I could say exactly who it was I lit on that occasion. But I'm afraid to say I've lost the notes, probably once owned the festival. Pamphlets, but they're all gone. And here's another one, I don't know if that was the Almeida, but there's a lovely... I just remember this trumpet was just so haunting and beautiful, that's why I say that photograph. It's just, but a lot of the time people think of avant-garde music as all these annoying, irritating things like Stockhausen or even worse, with people just, and it was, sometimes you just have the people come up with some tape recorder, they switch it on, sit down, and you just sit listening to all this pre-recorded electronic stuff. But other times it was very emotional, you got people up on stage and they had this weird set of instructions about what to do and how, to, and then they were left to interpret the this mysterious um, command. So uh, I think avant-garde music at its best is something incredible. Here's a group that tried to find a, a, a joining between avant-garde, jazz, and pop, and they called themselves Man Jumping. And initially, they must have got a lot of money from somewhere because they performed at the Queen Elizabeth Hall, I believe, and that's one of my designs I did for them. And around the same time, I had a gentleman who put on a symphony orchestra at the Queen Elizabeth Hall, also in a very experimental way in terms of the way he presented the symphony orchestra. Mm -hmm. We are playing how quite regular, um, this is I think, uh, the Firebird, yeah, this is Stravinsky's Firebird, so the music's not so experimental. And um, yeah, came and went, something of an era. And then also, I've also obviously many times been tempted. People say, please come and do something for your nightclub. So, this is a club somewhere, I'm not quite sure where, um, and so I did those from time to time. And then also, there's a picture of me and a picture of all my chums. Let's have a look at the chums, I think that's a really good show. So here we are, this picture actually appeared in, I'm trying to remember the name of the magazine, does it tell me on the notes here? Um, no it doesn't. So we appeared in a beautiful magazine, all in, come back to me in a minute. French magazine. Nope, I've forgotten. Okay, I didn't, I didn't do research. My, <laughs> I didn't practice my speech, as you can tell now. So we were a group of informally gathered artists who were exhibiting in a small gallery, even smaller, but sort of somewhat comparable with this space. And we were a kind of ad hoc group that formed around the theme of chaos. Because in the early 90s, suddenly chaos became fashionable because it wasn't merely just the chaos that we're seeing going on in Ukraine now. Chaos was a very clearly defined mathematical idea, and remains so, a very interesting idea, and it inspired a lot of people because suddenly you can see how, even when you have a, something that is a strictly structured system, like with precise laws, as mathematics tends to be, doesn't mean that outcomes are predictable. Just like weather, um, however good we get at predicting weather, we'll never be you know, completely reliable at it, and that's because of chaos. The fact that some things just simply can't be predicted. I, I love, as an artist, I think, oh, that's wonderful. I, I like the idea of not knowing what's going to happen next. 
Um, here's some of my early experiments, again, when I was starting to work with high speed and, and colour. This is not a string, but it's fibre objects being vibrated. And here's a kind of group shot of that column there, it's all very blurry. That is an early wave sculpture of the sort we've got here. And that's the fibre optic sculpture on the back. I'm sorry it's also out of focus. I wasn't a very good photographer in those days. Um, and this is the first time I ever got a sort of prestigious commission. Um, sadly, only for a temporary commission, but at least for one summer, um, some group of uh, arts organisers inspired different companies around the centre city of London to spend money on ins inviting artists to come along and do something wonderful for them. So here I am in the headquarters of BC, and that is St Paul's Cathedral in the background. So that was really that wow moment. Here I am, I'm sitting in this prestigious building, and the caretakers allowed to let me in late at night, and I can sit here fiddling around with the programming, trying to make it do interesting things, and I built this what was essentially a mad contraption because it was vibrating fibre optics and it was doing it on a stand about four metres in the air over the main entrance as you walked in so you a rattling noise by date. <laughs> it wasn't the best engineered thing ever and it wouldn't have lasted much more than the six weeks it was supposed to be there but the six weeks it had intent entertained us all with this kind of surreal fire-like quality. Here's another shot of it that it went through a sequence of different colours. But again this is all Although there was a computer to control, it was quite primitive compared with today. It was electromechanical. And we had a limited choice of what it could do. And I think this one was the, the, the pinnacle of the electromechanical phase. Here I built a magnificent giant waveform sculpture, which was exhibited in New York in 1998. And that was the first one that really felt truly monumental. And I'm really, really proud of this piece. Um, <coughs> So proud of it. I wonder if we're going to get this to work or not. I've got this very, very old video. And if I press the video play button, that works. <coughs> Embedded inside. I think it's work. Hope so. Oh no, it's doing it on the wrong screen. Oh, please um, come back. No, sorry. I'm so I'm usually good with these, but I know one particular horrible oh, thing. No. Yeah. Horrible things about PowerPoint presentations is they're very wonky mm. um, video. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So it's an hour 40 into the... Don't take any notes. <laughs> my, my camera operator was not an expert camera operator. It shouldn't have been there at all. It should have been only for our reference. Not for permanent. Things are going to the planes. <laughs> Part of what made it so magnificent was, of course, the location. The New York Hall of Science was originally built for the World Trade Fair in 1964. Mm. And at that point, the Americans had announced, of course, they were going to the moon in that famous speech by Kennedy, but they didn't yet know how they were going to get there exactly. But they built a kind of simulation of how they thought they might get there, and it was suspended in the ceiling of this magnificent cathedral-like room which they built, and the room was about 30 metres tall and 60 metres long. This is absolutely huge and literally, uh, I'm not exaggerating the numbers. And, and mine was one of a number of magnificent, I think three magnificent large-scale light installations which they had there in 1998. I've got a shame video, it was so rubbish in those days. <laughs> the best we could have managed to arrange in our modest budget. 
They're very hard to film, aren't they? Moving things. Yes. Fast moving. A very low light level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Material. How on earth am I supposed to finish telling you everything I want to talk about in the next 20 minutes? I have no idea. I'm probably about a quarter of the way through my material, a third of the way through my material. <laughs> For me, it was definitely a, a breakthrough moment. Um, um, after that, I continued to show stuff in public, of course. This is a little project they had in Covent Garden, something called the, uh, the Newtopia uh, Internet Lounge. At that point, the internet was the latest thing, and nobody could actually necessarily connect with it at home. So the organisers had the idea that you would do it in a lounge. So that's to say, a sort of cafe, which would be very expensive and stylishly designed and you could go and hang out and they made it like this sort of futuristic nightclub atmosphere and again they invited various um, artists to come along and showcase their work in this space so that's um, what that was and here's now now i'm sort of getting the, the craft of doing monumental on a uh, down but it's on a much more modest space here i'm in, in an old uh, market hall in manchester and that was a nice show but not quite so amazing as New York because location does make a lot of difference as I, as I, as I came to learn as I did many shows in many locations it's the same place in Manchester, it's the same place here we are in Spain in Spain they've got an awful lot of churches which are no longer used as churches because the Spanish um, fairly much despise the church because Catholicism under Franco just sidled up to them they didn't leave the Spanish in a, in a very good not, they're not a very worshipful race anymore, unlike the Italians, who some have forgotten Mussolini was a monster, and they've never forgiven Franco. So all the churches tend to get turned into art centres, which is brilliant for artists, because suddenly all these magnificent old buildings are available to do fun things in. Another big wave. The wave has just taken my life over at this point in time, and it, I, I suppose it, I, ne I never will get away from the wave, in a sense. But. Uh, as you know, I'm now starting to do other things with engraving, which I tend to try and talk about as well, if we can ever get past all these wave shots. Waves, waves, more waves, waves everywhere. <laughs> now, this particular wave I, I remember with much affection, I hope, yes, I think we've got it in the next shot. This wave's in Berlin, but what's memorable about it is, I didn't invite him, I didn't know who he was, but we were all mesmerised when the mysterious naked ja Japanese gentleman started to dance <laughs> underneath my wave. He's at Sushi Takanushi. He's one of the world's most famous um, Bhutto dancers. And Bhutto was all about seizing the moment and doing improvisational things, but in a strangely kind of ritualistic way. So he's, he's a definite master of it. He really grabbed us all. And it was wonderful to watch him perform. Uh, I was very nervous that the rope would wrap itself up around him. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the performance did indeed end with it rope wrapping around him, so it wasn't such a long performance, but it was very lovely for the short ride it lasted. I think it's also from Berlin. And some more waves from somewhere or other, perhaps I don't even need to tell you where, just to give you a general feeling, lots and lots of waves. I mostly did these shows in France and Spain, I think I got invited to a lot of places in the continent, the English seem to have no interest at all in futuristic art back in the 90s. It was just, as far as they were concerned, not something we did here. It's taken a long time for the message to kind of filter back across the water. And, uh, so it's a great pleasure to be finally sort of famous in my own country rather than having to trudge all around the world. And, uh, here we are testing a piece in a magnificent, huge, but obviously very functional space. It's actually a TV studio in Bangkok. And we're assembling and testing this great beast, <coughs> which is going to go and be set up here in this archway in Milan for the Van Design Week. And that's the foot of the Chinese. Remember, there's more recent things actually. Um, now, also, um, a set up job in a beautiful sort of tunnel like space. The gallery is um, 
completely windowless, and I suggested they painted it entirely black, and they agreed amazingly. It was a lot of work, but that definitely made for another amazing breakthrough exhibition. And this exhibition is called The Timeless Universe, and this is the first occasion on which I collaborated with, um, maybe collaboration is a slight exaggeration, but I invited a famous uh, scientist to come along, and he agreed to come out to Valencia. His name is uh, Julian Barbour. He's a cosmologist who speculated that time may not exist. So he wrote a book uh, called The End of Time. I was reading it, and the curator said, what are you reading at the moment when I was planning this exhibition? I said, The End of Time, and that was it. That was how the, it was essentially chosen, and, they, and she persuaded me to try and invite him. Amazingly, he was very happy to turn up. So, um, yeah, so we stuck some equations in there. I don't know about exactly about The End of Time. I think I nicked those equations from out of my father's book, which seems a legitimate thing to do. But my dad was a mathematician, so probably gave me a slight heads up in the world of being able to think mathematically, but I don't pretend to understand those equations or most of what he ever did, because it was hard stuff. <laughs> and it's really work it to understand one little tiny corner of those mysterious worlds. So, yes, space time as expressed by general relativity. Very interesting though. Um, my my in in involvement with curved space time, as you can see, is more sculpturally voluptuous. Now here's another unforgettable moment, which is, comes out of my. This becomes now like as I'm showing all my holiday snaps. This is, just to point it out carefully, that is the Wailing Wall. Mm. So we're in Jerusalem. That's the we call the, the Temple Mount. At least that's what Jewish people do. I've got another name depending on what religion you're in. Uh, and around the Temple Mount on, on the, um, the western flank is, is this archaeological park with the various ruins. And they invited the artists to set up the temporary installations for the first ever um, <coughs> light festival they had in Jerusalem, I think it was in 2011. That's Al-Aqsa, so that's one of the most revered mosques in the world. And I was sitting with my installation almost directly at the feet of Al-Aqsa. And every night uh, there used to be this lovely atmospheric sound of, and I don't know if I dare frame it, should we the video? <laughs> Gone wonky again, isn't it? Terrible thing. Please come back. No. Nope. Uh, completely lost it. Yeah, okay. I don't know if I'm going to do that. I'll play it to you later if you ask me. I'm <laughs> not going to attempt it now. Sure. I'm sorry about that. Ah! <sighs> Too many things. I'm going to crack that one about videos embedded in Palestine. That was wrong every time. So, some more waves, some more waves, some more waves, some more waves. Oh, yes, I should explain that at this point in my life, I've also started selling various commissions to science centres. And of course, they want it to be interactive. So, you have a cut screen. And the touch screen allows you to choose the colour combinations going on in the installation. It's a rather lovely thing. I wish we had one here, but every time I've bought a touch screen, it's always been for a client. And that's it. They've gone out the door again. And this is, again, a cosmic theme. This exhibition is inspired from reading that the whole universe might be spinning. Well, as we all know, every heavenly body spins. The Earth spins. The the Earth's going round, the Sun's going round the centre of the galaxy, the whole galaxy is spinning, the galaxy itself is moving relative to its neighbour galaxies. But the conjecture might be that the entire universe could be spinning. Uh, and I wrote to the professor who thought of this idea, Professor Michael Longo, and he gave me all his raw data. Then I put the data into the animation, so the video projecting and this projecting extracts from all the information he sent me. Um, and the evidence actually is quite conclusive that the universe is spinning a bit in our area of the universe, but overall we can't really say there's any signs that it probably is spinning out. We've never seen anything in the universe that's not spinning. Mm -hmm. Well, it, the, the idea was that the entire universe would be gently turning, but... That would be sensible. It, it would be sensible, but the evidence doesn't seem to support it currently. So there, there's a very strong sign of a local spin out to a, a billion light years or so, which is unfortunately not 
big enough to be very important as far as the cosmologist is concerned, but that's what Michael proved, and it, it got a few people in, things over the centuries since. Some other shots of the that lovely space. And then the, that, that image that you've seen possibly before, because I got to it because on my screen, that's a, my moment when I was working for Fat Paris Fashion Week, so this gives you more of an idea of what the girls looked like as they walked in and out. They came through this mysterious magical gateway, which was a, filled with my waveforms. And this gives you sort of more of a feel of what it was really like, and get away from the trick photographs. So there's my work inside the, the tunnel entrance, as it were. And there's a space where all the girls come out and walk around on these bright, bright light lights. And that's all. Techie crew are helping set it all up. It's an amazing operation to actually set up a fashion show. The show's in the last 15 minutes. Costs about, I've sold about 150,000 euros, you know, gets spent on that 15 minutes, but apparently it's worth it. Uh, and an uh, incredible amount of organisation involved. We're going to get about 1,000 people sitting in this space, and we're going to, you know, all the lighting, rig, everything is brought in from scratch. There's nothing there when we arrived two days before. So it's like dozens of people just descend on there, and just, the technicians are very coordinated. They just build, 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 and it all just happens amazingly quick. Really a pleasure to watch just what good engineers they are and how they put it all together in the field. And this is my own attempt at doing something very efficiently at a, on a large scale. This is uh, the last major exhibition I ever did. This is last autumn in Ireland, in Slane Castle. Uh, maybe we have this going on in the loop. People actually see this one, so you've seen the video of this. And it's the best video by far. I've only now finally managed to do decent, clear video, so the others would have been very fuzzy. Now, Still got a bit of time? Oh yes, it's only here to clock. I can over this. It's my show. <laughs> <laughs> I like to sort of get into this subject of how does this all segue into art in general? Because I'm sure I'm not the only person to become obsessed with waves. For example, a very famous man when he became elderly could no longer do anything except with a pair of scissors, Matisse. And if you ever watched the videos of Matisse cutting with his scissors, it's like he's making all these waves as he cuts, all these little shapes, magically rapidly scissored out. And that's just uh, amazing what he did in, in, in his final years. There's another Matisse, and another Matisse. And now, you might think that's a mother Matisse, but it's not. It's Jan Arp, or Hans Arp, depending on if he's German French. Uh, so they're all kind of nicking ideas off each other. And so here's another Arp. Uh, and that there's sort of fascination with very simple, vaguely wave like shapes in my mind. There's a, another Arp. Art also made sculptures, and also, I don't know who, there was some argument about who invented the idea of putting a hole in the sculpture. This, anyway, this was his claim to um, putting a hole in the sculpture for anybody to But the sculpture I love more than anybody, and so this takes us even further back into the history of modern art, Brancusi. So that's Brancusi. And Brancusi's work is so vibrational. I mean, it's just, it is waves. I mean, just look at that. Those things, they just look exactly like some of my largest but the sculptures were carved out of wood, or I think it's wood, not uh, not formed of, of, of light as I choose to work. But I, but I see such a kind of uh, connection there. And I, as I said, my mum was an artist, so she she kind of introduced me to the contemporary art. I got a very good education from her about what was going on. So it was all the stuff was in the back of my mind. Not to forget that Naum Garbo actually set a thin metal rod in vibration and declared that to be a work of art. It's one of the first ever kinetic works of art. When was that? Naum Garbo. For what year? Probably about 1935, maybe. He also made things that looked like this, and this became a kind of craft craze, people making stuff like this, where you stretch strings over a translucent frame, framework. Uh, and so he was much copied. Now, what about this? It's much more monumental. This is Henry Moore. I mean, Henry Moore, oh, surely it's all about landscape and, and the human figure all meld together. It's nothing to do with waves, so it's just very, very, I mean, this is beautiful, isn't it? It's very graceful, it's wave-like, but it's obviously a woman as well with a pair of breasts that well. Next up, I generated this on a computer using some fairly simple algorithms. And now I ask you, just trace your eye around this line here. It's Henry Morris. It's there in the wave equations. There's a definite connection between waveform 
and something that was going on in the imagination of quite a few 20th century abstract artists. So I made a few more like this. And here I'm using one small shape as a silhouette to kind of stencil grab and then use the you know, change of scale to cut out a bit of something else. And also, this is really why I wanted to show this is where the engraving started because later I thought, well, how about I, I trace all the lines, the divides between the blue and whites, and use those lines only. And that is the basis of all the engraved art you see here, all these acrylic works that are glowing started as waveforms, which were then transformed with a two-step process. And that's the end of it for now. Well, I'd like to be able to organise another lecture where I give you a master class <laughs> in how you can turn what's called a ripple tank in my physics classes back long ago. We'd literally have a tank of water where we'd look at the waves um, and we'd just study how waves interact on the surface of water. So I recreated a ripple tank in software some years ago. And the basis of everything you see here is a ripple tank on steroids, so to speak, because I've broken all the rules. The waves no longer behave like waves on the surface of water, but they're waves moving across the surface, but a virtual surface. Okay, well, we're going to have a short break, and then we're going to have two fascinating other speakers who may be able to present you with something even more amazing than me and possibly a lot more polished in their style. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs>